हेलो एंड वार्म वेलकम टू एवरीवन ऑन दिस फिफ्टींथ नेशनल वेबिनार ऑन मेडिकल एजुकेशन ऑर्गेनाइज्ड बाय डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ मेडिकल एजुकेशन जिपमर पुडुचेरी माय सेल्फ डॉक्टर महापात्रा एडिशनल प्रोफेसर एंड हेड ऑफ प्लास्टिक सर्जरी आई विल बी वर्किंग बिहाइंड द सीन्स टुडे द टॉपिक फॉर टुडेज वेबिनार इज मेंटरशिप इन मेडिकल एजुकेशन व्हिच विल बी डिलीवर्ड बाय प्रोफेसर जॉन स्टीफन फ्रॉम सेंट जॉन मेडिकल कॉलेज हॉस्पिटल बेंगलोर जस्ट टू गिव अ ब्रीफ इंट्रोडक्शन ऑन दिस टॉपिक फॉर द पार्टिसिपेंट्स students in medical colleges are vulnerable to challenges of medical course and mentoring programs are known to offer support and to acquire knowledge attitude and skills among medical students though there is largely no formal mentorship program in indian medical schools uh, 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 there is uh, students imbibe characteristics from the role model uh, as a part of hidden curriculum this however is not optimal and we have to ensure that the benefits of mentoring reach each and every student mentoring is a goal driven process and the success of any mentoring program depends on how it is structured and documented hence there is a need for formal uh, training to establish and operate mentorship programs in medical colleges and to achieve curricular objectives towards this goal uh, today's speaker dr john stephen will share his thoughts and experience in mentoring in medical education i would like to give a brief introduction of our esteemed speaker today dr john stephen he is a professor in dermatology and medical education at st john medical college bangalore for the last, he has been in uh, uh, practice for 20 years in clinical and teaching experience and 12 years of leadership in medical education now is heading the department of medical education at st john medical college bangalore he was the former uh, uh, member of the who guideline development group on common skin and oral opportunistic in, uh, infection in children and adults with this brief introduction i would like to invite prof john stephen to start his uh, uh, presentation and request all the participants to put their questions in the chat box which will be taken at the end of the presentation uh, prof john stephen would you like to start thank you sir can you hear me thank you very much sir okay can i share my slides now yeah uh, yes, you can do it sir is the slides visible yes sir the slides are visible sir okay wonderful okay so thank you everybody and special thanks to dr jay prakash and um, jipa department of medical education for giving me this opportunity to participate in this program and uh, this basically i put the first slide this is my institution st john's medical college in bangalore and um, mentoring i've been particularly interested in mentoring for some time now and uh, in st john's we've had mentoring almost from the inception and in, uh, from the 1970s and uh, we they called it at that time guardianship and uh, we had a, when we did our mbbs in st john's each of us had a guardian a, a senior faculty who was a guardian and then over the years we have tweaked it many times and we do have a mentoring program at st john's and uh, the uh, medical education department here we worked with uh, hiv aids and developed training programs for clinical mentoring and uh, done training with the who in karur and davangere and also done programs in kenya so we've sort of dabbled with mentoring for some time now and it certainly has been something very close to my heart and uh, really glad to participate in this program so with this uh, brief introduction let me go straight to the a uh, session as such behind every successful man there is a yeah usual thing is a woman but for my session i'll call it between every successful man or a woman there often is a mentor if you close your eyes and look and think about on the successful people that you can think about you'll usually find there is a mentor or a mentee relationship somewhere i'll give you some i'll craft take you through some examples here there are many examples that we can go to Oprah Winfrey and Maya Angelou a very well known relationship a menti mentor relationship and Oprah Winfrey openly has acknowledged this that all her success is due to Maya Angelou and i always i mean you should read Maya Angelou and uh, some of the things that she says are wonderful i picked up one thing that has always stayed in my heart and it's wonderful i teach i tell this to my pgs when they start the course and this is one of maya's Uh, saying that's when you get you give when you learn you teach 
So I often tell this to my PGs that teaching is part of your, your profession and your career. And of course, we know about Bill Gates and Warren and their relationship. But if you want to reflect on that particular relationship, both of them are successful. In fact, you would look to, look to them as mentors, both each. Okay, the second richest man and the third richest man. But one is a mentee and one is a mentor. Again, the lines may blur. There are certain aspects for which Warren has acknowledged will to be responsible for the success and vice versa. So mentorship and mentee goes both ways. So we could go many more examples. If you want to talk about Arjuna and Krishna, we can go again. There are many examples uh, that we can think about. And of course, in our medical literature, in the history of medicine, the famous uh, uh, couple that we talk, think of is William Osler, uh, the, for us, the father of medical education as such, and Cushing, having Cushy. Harvey was actually uh, uh, under Halstead, worked under Halstead as a surgeon, but Osler actually picked him out and uh, brought him into his pack as such. And there's the there's stories of their relationship goes far, far. And in fact, there was a such sign, uh, time when uh, William Osler's son was treated by Cushing. And so there's, there, are, there are many, many relationships that we can look at and uh, about all the successful people. So what we're going to do in the next 40 minutes is sort of focus mostly on the what and the why. And I'm hoping that the how we can cover in the question time, because how to do mentoring is a biggish area. And I think it's very important, the what and the why. So we'll try and cover the what and the why in the first 40 minutes or so, and maybe have some time for questions where we can touch upon the how and those aspects as well. So what is mentoring? There are, if you, if you look into literature, there are many definitions for mentoring. I picked one and it goes like this. Uh, mentoring is a reciprocal relationship between an experienced, highly regarded, empathetic person, that's the mentor, and a less experienced junior faculty student member, the mentee aimed at fostering the professional and personal development of the junior faculty student member. This is from the Standing Committee on Postgraduate Medical and Dental Education. Now, if you look at it, the words are very, I have sort of highlighted some words. If you look at it, the first thing that comes out in the definition, it's a, it's a reciprocal relationship. It's not a one-way traffic. If there is a responsibility and duty of the mentee and the mentor, and it goes both ways. It cannot succeed with only one person attempting it both need to participate in that relationship. Otherwise, a mentoring or mentee-mentor relationship doesn't work. The second thing that comes out is, it's basically between somebody who's experienced, highly regarded empathetic person, and a less experienced junior faculty student member. Now, that's how usually it works. But as you go along, as you go along, and the relationship between mentee and mentor carries on for some time, as in the example of Bill Gates and Warren, it can go both ways. In sometimes the mentor would be the highly uh, experienced person. In some aspects, the mentee could also be, it could go both ways. Generally, there is somebody who has something to give and there is somebody who has something to receive. And of course, it's not only about academic, it's about professional and personal development. That's what it is. So these are the important aspects of that uh, definition. So the point basically is, it's not only just academic, that's what we tend to focus when we're talking about mentoring in the context of medical education. It also should involve the personal support and professional development. So what's the role of the mentor? It could be, should be a sounding board. A mentor should be a role model, a challenger, a career counselor, a developmental advisor professional advisor, critical friend, facilitator, and we can go on. There are so many aspects that the mentor should be. But I think in one way for us to understand the concept uh, of what a mentor is, one way to look at it is look at the negative. What a mentor is not about. A mentor is not about doing the mentee's work for them. A mentor or mentoring is not about supervision. It's not just trying to keep tab on what is the attendance, did the person come on time and no, that's not mentoring. 
it's not about just filling the gaps as far as the skill deficits are concerned it's not about treatment it's not trying to solve that person's personal problem that's not mentoring so i think the, if you when you start looking at what it is not it gives you a different perspective to what mentoring is but how is it is it similar to teaching how does it relate to teaching maybe we can look at that as well so i've given you some examples here and we'll go through one at a time and just to bring out that subtle difference between what a teacher is and what a mentor could be okay for example let's take the first one a teacher tells you to read a book then tests you on your retention of the facts on the other hand a mentor reads a book with you then discusses how the book changed you both the second one let's take the second one teacher often tells you important information mentor provides the opportunity for you to discover the information teacher understands his or her job to be that of educating a mentor understands his or her job to be that of inspiring the students to educate themselves syllabus yes is planned as far as you know our teaching is concerned but on the other hand there in when it comes to mentoring when we deal with our students we have many moments where there are every moment you find these teaching moments and in some you know they will occur in some fashion and and the, that uh, interaction is where uh, a lot of the learning occurs fifth point there is limitation in the amount of time that we give to the student in mentorship there is no limitation there is no limitation it's very generous and it can go beyond any uh, uh, the teaching us teacher imparts the same information to each student equally a mentor observes each student makes suggestions based on their individual needs passions and skill so it's a, i'm just giving you these sort of comparisons between a teacher and a mentor just to bring out that subtle difference between a mentor and a teacher it's quite possible that after reading through this you may question and say maybe as teachers what we should do what is written for mentors is what the teacher should be doing but isn't that true actually as we go from first mbbs and then we if we were to reflect on our interaction with our postgraduate students we actually move from what is mentioned under teachers to what is mentioned under mentors as we go further and you will begin to lead a department you're a senior in the department you have junior faculty you move so it actually there is a there it's sort of part of the same spectrum but if you see there is a subtle difference between a mentor and a teacher in many ways what how we interact with our junior faculty for for example could be the mentoring area how we interact with the pg looks like what we should do and so yes both may have some aspects of teaching but how it is done is what's the difference so there is this difference with what we can we conceptualize as a teacher and what we conceptualize as mentor so if you look at it there are lots of elements that we can discuss you know there are many many factors to discuss what what i'm going to do uh, is sort of uh, discuss a few points that we can sort of reflect upon and i think it's important for us to reflect upon these points to find mentoring important and also help in designing the program within our institution so i put it as points to ponder so we're going to talk about the unconscious bias is the glass half full the helicopter view it's not just encouragement it's all about dreams so these are the five points that we will talk about let's take the first one now when we talk about clinical mentoring there are many aspects that we discussed on that but at the core of it the essential thing that determines the success of clinical mentoring and the clinical mentoring program at the heart of it is relationship building it is the relationship building it's the relationship that is the key factor for the success of mentoring without doubt that is the most important factor now that is at the heart actually it's it's at the heart of if you you can discuss about interactions listening many non judgmental many things are there but at the heart of it all is relationship building and trust without relationship building and without trust there will be no mentoring at luck so in this context i want to talk to you about something called the unconscious bias it's also called shortcuts how long does it take for someone to form 
11 opinions about you. Let's say you meet a new person and you just shake a hand. And how long does it take for you to form 11 opinions about the other person? And how, 11, and how long does it take for the other person to form 11 opinions about you? Studies have shown that if opinions this take just seven seconds, in seven seconds, we've already passed judgment on so many aspects. The person is responsive, or oh, he looks knowledgeable. I think this is a friendly person, he looks like a credible person, empathetic. It occurs without even you thinking about it. It sort of occurs in the unconscious. Okay, you make a judgment call. We, call, we can say we sync with that person. Okay, we are on the same wavelength. It's a sixth sense. You call it what you want. But we do make these shortcuts or in seven seconds, we do this. And, and this is a bias sometimes that comes in the way of relationship building. When you meet your mentees, it could be an undergraduate student, it could be a postgraduate student. All of us in the seven second pass judgment on that. And uh, very often there's a, there a student in whom we sort of immediately sink and we think it's a wonderful thing. We, we don't mind having this relationship, mentor, mentorship mentee relationship, but we pass judgment on many others and we don't feel like in some situations. There is a bias. It could be related to your, whether, you know, your power and equality. What I mean, power and equality is sometimes the mentor feels higher in the power or lower in the power. It could be cultural, it will be social. You may, you may pass <coughs> a judgment, sorry, on the competence. You find that the person is, the mentee is Competent, not competent, dumb, smart, you know, uh, we could. So there is a little bias that we. So one of the things we should be aware of uh, is that this bias exists. <clears throat> and quite often, we, uh, if this bias is there, this is the first stumbling block <coughs> for the relationship building. I remember uh, I, uh, one of the examples that I can think of. I'm sure you'll relate to many examples of your own. And I remember in one year, we had a postgraduate who joined it, who had uh, already married, had two kids. And uh, after many years came and joined in as a postgraduate. And in my mind, I said, okay, looks like priorities are different. They, their priorities were about setting up a family. And maybe this person's doing, meant <coughs> doing the course only for the sense of I don't know what the sense is, how come so late? And I had already passed judgment. But looking back now, without doubt, I can say that that particular person was perhaps the best postgraduate student we've ever had. And sometimes that happens, we do pass our judgments and, you know, and that sort of hinders our relationship with them. So the other way, I, I often use this as another way to describe the same phenomenon. The glass, how we look at the glass, as half full or half empty. And uh, this is, it's, yes, it can relate to mentoring, but it could relate to any interaction, actually speaking. You know? And uh, the studies have shown that when you, whenever you have an interaction, things, there may be you know, bad elements to that interaction, there may be good elements to it. When you begin to focus on the good elements, Usually, there's a lot of benefits to that. I'll give you some examples. I mean, usual examples. Let's say, for example, I'm sitting. I go to the OPD. I've gone. At, my OPD starts at 8:30. I'm there at 8:25. PG walks in. The postgraduate who's supposed to sit with me walks in at nine o'clock. Now, the, there are there could be one of two responses here. One, you can say, "How dare you? If I can come at 8:25, how dare you come at nine o'clock?" The other response could be, find out what happened first, okay? Maybe something happened, maybe there was an accident, there's something by broke down, some relevant things are there. In a lot of the things, we tend to uh, immediately pass judgment and then that kills the interaction and that kills uh, a further interaction. In mentoring, when you get a new person as a mentee, a lot of these judgments come in the way. So you, Sometimes you look at the glass as being half empty. And sometimes you look at it saying, okay, there is potential here, so it didn't interest you. So these are the biases that we go with. 
But remember, no glass is completely empty. Everybody, every mentee has something to give. There is something wonderful inside. We'll come to that story. This is uh, uh, an example from, I, I am sure some of you would have heard about um, Ken Robinson in one of his talks. I picked this up. I thought it's a wonderful thing. And uh, he talks about this Death Valley in Nevada. And then this is the Death Valley. And he said that in, um, there is no, there's absolutely no rain in this particular area and absolutely no vegetation. For years and years, there has been no vegetation at all and no rain. It's, and usually, you know, insects and scorpions and snakes, those are what's known for this particular valley. But what happened supposedly was in 2002, there was one year where it rained. It rained for a, a few days and heavy rain for a few days. And what happened surprisingly was in the next spring, this is what they found in the same valley. It was carpeted with flowers. So actually that's what Ken Robinson talks about and says that very often uh, we tend to look at the glass as being empty. Okay, but given if the opportunities are given, if the environment is positive and if there is enough support, there is always something underneath there that you can nurture and bring out. And it is just waiting for this particular environment to blossom. And uh, that's, that is what the mentoring is all about. That being the experienced mentor that and be, having gone through life and, and having gone through this, to realization that that particular seed exists and for you to give the confidence and the support for and provide that particular uh, environment for that particular seed to blossom. Okay, and that is what I meant by saying there is no glass is not no glass is ever empty. We have to think about that, you know. And if you look at what Roosevelt said, people don't care what you know until they know that you care. So the first point is that you know it basically boils down to this. When we talk about mentorship, I think the first thing is about us, the mentors. Very often, the unconscious bias, the way we look at the glass being half full or half empty, the realization of the seed there in, the, in that barren land. I mean, this unconscious bias is what stands between a good mentor, mentorship relationship and no relationship. I, I remember participating as a mentor in St. John's. In the earlier days, uh, we, till, till about two years back, we always, mentoring students was always a voluntary uh, activity. In St. John's, they asked faculty, would you be interested to be a mentor? And only if the faculty was interested, they were put into that roster and a, ment and a mentee allotted to them. And I have put up my hand more than once. And for the first two, three years, it never worked. And I think it's mostly because of the intention deficit. The first thing is you should want to do it as a mentor. You should find value in that. You should think that it, you want to make that difference. If you just start a program as a mentor and that intention is not there for you to make that happen, it doesn't happen. Okay. So if you're indifferent, you're not passionate about it, you're, you know, you're very impersonal about it, apathetic about it now. So I find that if you look at perhaps the most common obstacle for a successful mentors program, I think this is this intention deficit. And I think this intention deficit actually comes from the unconscious bias. And we all have this bias. I think it's important for us, even before we even design a program, to reflect and acknowledge the fact that this exists. And we need to constantly remind ourselves that we need to go beyond this to make that mentor mentorship uh, a successful program. I told you, so relationship building and trust is the core. And for this, the, we have to remove those particular blocks, the intention deficit and the unconscious bias. There is a core within this actually. It is also very, very important. And that is your, you have to have something to give. If you're a mentor, you need to have something to give. You, for example, if you're a mentor in your own speciality, you're an orthopedician and you 
are a mentor, you should have knowledge, skill, experience. If you, if you have something to give, only if you are at that cutting edge, can you be a mentor. So there is a, the, the inner core is actually your competence itself, right? And you can, you can talk about mentorship in research as well. I mean, you can't be doing a research mentorship without doing research. I mean, you should have done it and been there. And there is a little, that is the inner, inner core. And so we need to have that. So building this, without this, there's no mentorship is not going to work, right? So that is the core as well. Just sort of, I'm not dwelling on this point, but I do want to mention that within that, the fun, fundamental core is actually your knowledge, skill, experience, and wisdom. So that's what we said. We talked about the unconscious bias. We talked about the glass being half full or half empty. I just want to touch upon this something called, I, I'm calling it as the helicopter view. And uh, this particular statement was made by Mike Pegg. He's also one of those corporate mentor programs and you know trainer of great uh, repute. And I just picked this up from one of the presentations. And uh, he mentions great mentors provide a stimulating sanctuary in which people can take a helicopter view of their options. I think it's a wonderful thing. And I, if you reflect, if you look at it, the first thing that's important to note here is that it's a stimulating sanctuary. Now, stimulating means it has, to, it's not just a conversation. It's not mentor, mentee doesn't mean it has to be inspiring, motivating. No, that's our word. The stimulating is there. It's a stimulating. And the second one that is very important is actually sanctuary. The mentee should feel safe. I mean, if that's, a, that's the thing that is going to be, you have to over, if, let's say, for example, you have a mentorship program for an undergraduate uh, course. Uh, you are going to be their senior teacher and you'll have students under you as mentees, but you have to build a relationship over a period of time, because there, are, there is a particular way in which the students are going to be looking at you. But they, when you become a mentor, you have to make it, the relationship should be built so that they feel safe to talk about their issues. They talk about their challenges. They talk about their dreams. So it's not only going to should be inspiring, but you should provide a sanctuary. Sanctuary means a safe haven, okay? So it should be safe for them. They should feel safe to talk about anything they want without being judged. You know, it should not be judgmental there. So that's the second one that's important in the statement. The third one is about the helicopter view. The mentor's job is to give the mentee, because the mentor has been there and done that before. So to give the mentee a helicopter view, an overview of what are things to come, what are the obstacles that are there, what are the options that happen. I mean, that's the, the overall view, not a narrow view, a very broad overview. So about life, about career, about those things. So it's that view. And the fourth one that's very important is about not the mentor's options, but about the mentee's options. It's their options. So if you look at this particular statement, great mentors provide a stimulating sanctuary in which people can take a helicopter view of their options. So I thought this was a wonderful thing. So that's why I mentioned this as helicopter view. So it's not only should it be uh, stimulating and inspiring. It should be provide that safe sense to talk about anything without being judged, have an overview of their options. Very often, it should not become like this. Mentoring is not about the mentee becoming more and more like the mentor. Yeah? And it's not, that's not mentoring. Uh, they start looking like the same mentor itself. Yeah? That's not the idea. The idea is to talk about the mentee's option. Talk about how far the mentee can go and go beyond, you know, and that's what mentoring is all about. So another area is about uh, very often uh, when you start a mentoring program, this usually happens and uh, there's a structure to a mentoring program. You meet with a mentee and it becomes a, a like a, a fun thing to have a coffee together, uh, a chat like that together. It, it becomes a, a social sort of uh, meeting, getting to know. So you're focusing so much on building a relationship and trust. So, but mentoring is beyond that. Yes, relationship and trust and not being judgmental, 
and the mentee beginning to trust the relationship as you know the confidentiality of that all that you have to work towards yes but it's not just that you have to provide that particular guidance provide the environment for them to grow it's about personal development it's about you know not only providing support academic development and personal development so there's a thing saying that we don't grow when things are easy so it's not just a cozy meeting every now every 3 months it's about beyond that so if there is no action points at the end of the meeting and there should be minor challenges it along with the inspiration so it usually comes together isn't it so it usually the learning occurs from some sort of a balance between challenge and support okay the challenge cannot be so much that it's overwhelming on the other hand you need that support and mentors need to support their mentees but challenge and too it's not just about having a chat and being there for listening as a sounding board only it is it's an active process not a passive process that's what i wanted to bring out here that uh, it's a sort of a balance between challenge and support okay some of you will relate to this this is harry potter and we know here again there was a mentor and a mentee relationship we you know harry potter was in a way mentored by dumbledore of some those who have seen the movie understand this relationship i i brought this only to introduce to you the dementor okay if there is a mentor there is a dementor so remember this that all mentors are role models yes but not all role models are mentors right so as a mentor yes we always talk that it's a positive thing but in the mentorship relationship it's not just about yes inspiring and providing support comes in this it's a wonderful thing to teach ethics to teach professionalism it's it's you are a role model for that and in in many ways in the non structured mentoring programs the mentee chooses the mentor you know and uh, so it's important for you that to realize your responsibility here saying that you you know it's not just being a good role model but the bad elements will also have an impact on the mentee mentor relationship and also have an impact on the learning so it's not about just mentors think about the mentors as well this is about as kids don't we uh, when you go back to being in school okay and if you ask a child i i know what i wanted to be i want to be a not rickshaw driver at one point so uh, we all had dreams isn't it? and we, as we went through life in in the third standard you may have been wanting to be an auto rickshaw driver as you went along you wanted to be a pilot and then you you know the dreams changed and it, that is one of the things about uh, children and uh, as the situations arise and you, you begin to change your dreams right but uh, something happens in the teens somewhere around the 10th standard or around even 9th standard 10th standard 11th standard suddenly the pressure has begin the reality hits you and there is a sort of a point where you have to work in a particular way to go in a particular direction there is only one direction and you you know children go through this pressure of uh, parents maybe okay and your coaching classes you have a neat exam and it's all about studying it actually starts even in ninth standard 10th standard so the child has dreams yes but it all there's a lot of confusion that's occurring at that time and there's only one thing that everybody pushes you to and that is that you have to go for your tuition classes you have to crack the neat and it's all about physics chemistry maths biology physics chemistry maths biology and this is what the child goes through for two years and at the end of two years they somehow manage and get into uh, medicine right and get into medicine that's where you meet them in first time bbs and at that point at first time bbs they have done physics chemistry maths biology for two years and it's a relief that they just gotten and they just want to relax and they're not thinking of anything in anything in particular they've already achieved they've already come to mbps and it's a very confused state this that particular part of the adolescence and uh, it is it is here that they need that support it is that it's a very crucial time to provide that support in a way right 
and uh, in the first and the second MBBS is if you don't do that, they just go through life. If you, we can relate this also to our postgraduate students. You can just go day in and day out and just the question will be only about passing the exam. And that real passion for anything particular in that area is not there. And uh, this is something where the mentor comes in. This is where something where the mentor comes in. I always feel that the most important uh, uh, aspect of learning actually, it comes in the environment that they're set in. And that's where the mentorship also is part of that environment. If you were to look at medical college students, people who pass out MBBS, or for that matter, even post-graduation, we know that if a person has finished from uh, CMC Velo or St. John's or JITMA, we know there is a little quality to that, right? But it, if you take school, for example, you can go to a convent school, you can go to a corporation school, the product that's coming out, in some way, we sort of, we can relate to and say, okay, it's likely to be better in a particular situation. Even though the medical colleges, the MCI, and or maybe the same university is the same curriculum, the same, all of them take the same exams and go through this, you know, pass out from the same university. There is a difference in the quality and difference in what they can think of. And that difference occurs uh, because of the environment in which they grow. And one of the important parts of that environment in which they grow is about the mentorship. Okay, a lot of other things, the hidden curriculum and role modeling, but mentorship is one of those important areas which can have. So this sort of is, in a way, uh, my last thought on mentoring. And I want to end with this uh, particular aspect. Uh, Jim Carrey, and I think all of us know, and uh, this is the um, Walk of Fame. And uh, if you look at the Walk of Fame, he's written merrily, 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 merrily. And in one of the interviews, when he was asked about why did he write merrily, 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 he talked about saying that for him, uh, the rhyme, the row, row, row your boat was the rhyme that he really liked a lot. And he said that's very philosophical in a way. And uh, if you all remember, row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Merrily, 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 life is but a dream. And uh, that's what Jim Carrey says that at the end of it, it, what matters is the dream. If you have a dream and you know that this is where you want to go, you just have to work towards it. The, the most important part is to have that dream. You need to have that dream and crystallize on that dream. Once you have the dream, you just have it, you go, you move towards it, you labor towards it and find a path of reaching it. So as a mentor's job, actually, in a way, is to provide that dream for our students, whether it is undergraduates, postgraduates, it could be in any way, it could be research or otherwise, to give them that uh, purpose, to give them that energy and you know, that relevance to what they want to do and inspire and motivate them. I think if at all, if there's one thing that we want to do, that's all that we need to do. In fact, our students who come into MBBS nowadays, information gathering is not a problem. They're far better at in gathering information than us. I mean, now internet is there, you have everything uh, uh, on the net. Getting information is not an issue at all. It's about the dream. And I think in many ways, what the institutions do is nurture and build and shape dreams. I think as uh, mentors, actually what we do is shape the dream for them and, uh, and give them that dream. And, and that's, how, that's what takes them to the next level. And that's what I think at the end of the day, that's what is mentorship all about. In order to do and provide that sort of thing, you need to have a conversation and a relationship with a mentee. And it's only then that, that all these things occur. And also, you have to be interested in doing it. Only then that will happen. So to end, we, I think we should be very careful and aware of the unconscious bias. I think I consciously do that now. I tell myself, I talk to myself and say, I shouldn't be biased. 
okay it's the relationship building is the trust building that is the key to mentorship without doubt without working towards relationship building without working towards trust no mentorship program is going to be successful no glass is completely empty absolutely true and at the story of the death valley rings in my ear all the time and i think it's very very important to provide that environment and nurture your mentees and they will achieve many things of course the challenge versus support is another thing we talked about remember that it's not about just mentors it's about dementors as well but at the end of the day it's we are as 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 mentors our job is shaping the dream so let's enable to dream enable us mentees to dream facilitate the realization of their dream that's what mentees are about thank you and i'm open to questions thank you professor stephen for your illuminating presentation we have some questions from the audience i'll be reading sure. out one by one uh, yeah. we'll be glad to get your answers uh, sure. so the first question is from dr himanshu he is asking yes. what other resources can we refer for further exploring this topic resources okay the, the thing is i uh, i do have uh, some uh, slides on that there is enough literature actually if you look at uh, can i share my slides with that now for this i'll just share yes, my presentation yes, yeah you can share sir yeah i think i had some slides here let me see if i have it see uh, i i looked at the data you know this uh, there are i i i could give you a list and send you a list but uh, there are a lot of uh, wonderful books and other things but if you look at the work this is a publication uh, with regard to mentorship okay over the years it, the numbers have increased the studies on that have increased plenty of decrease i actually had this and didn't want to include because time was a problem there's is there evidence work about mentorship and uh, you know there are uh, most of them are very uh, cross sectional and very descriptive uh, most of the articles there are be few systematic reviews are available and um, uh, these are two that i mentioned here and uh, the evidence is mostly limited actually in a way about whether but there is enough evidence to say that it works and uh, the areas that usually that it definitely improves motivation and encouragement increase in research productivity confidence in professional and so it does have data on that um, so literature wise i don't have any particular book to talk about but information and uh, studies on uh, this particular aspect has uh, it been increasing over the years and uh, i if you talking about a specific uh, thing i don't seem to have a specific name for a book to read yeah yes sir uh there is one more question sir yes uh okay uh is it is it a thin line between a good teacher and a mentor this is asked by dr radhika i agree with you i think so because i i mentioned this when i talked about that table uh when you start look comparing a teacher's qualities and a mentor's qualities sometimes you look back and say actually a good mentor is a good teacher as well and i think that's what happens the you know the line is very thin and as a mentor there is a teaching but mentorship goes a little beyond that in the sense uh when you when you are a professor and you have students under you there is a certain responsibility and a duty for particular uh, uh the class and for the curriculum but mentorship goes beyond that because for uh, there's also some things like conflict of interest for example if you are correcting the paper of that student and that student happens to be a mentee there's a conflict of interest because as a mentor you are the relationship that you have with the students is a little different you are non judgmental you want to help the student whatever way we have as a teacher you're going to be absolutely impartial and give them the actual feedback you know so there is that little bit of a conflict to be so there is a subtle difference yes but in terms of uh, you know supporting them yes as a teacher also we want to do that absolutely thank you sir uh, dr tasneem has a comment to make 
I think yes, as a mentor, yes. we should create equal opportunities to all our students, in spite of their different school backgrounds. Then uh, there is one more question: uh, Do we have any formal training workshop for developing this aspect, by Dr. Himanshu? Uh, we uh, we have designed a workshop for mentoring. See, the thing another another aspect about mentoring that I did not touch upon. Uh, I mentioned briefly that in St. John's, initially we had something called the guardianship. Now the guardianship was only because in St. John's at that time, St. John's was in the outskirts. Most of the students left their family and came and stayed in the hostel. So there was a guardian, a parent figure in the campus to go to. But later on, we shifted to clinical mentoring. Now clinical mentoring and research mentoring is a little different from guardianship. Okay. Now, for example, I did mention about how we developed on-site mentoring for HIV AIDS training. In on-site mentoring for HIV AIDS training, we trained doctors and we provided the support for the doctors working in the field in clinical medicine, in clinical management of uh, HIV AIDS training. So when you're, when you're designing a mentorship program, like a research mentorship can be a little different design from a guardianship. And a clinical mentor design can be a little different. Uh, even if I take the example of what's happening in St. John's, we have a mentorship program where all undergraduate students have a mentor, which, go, which they pick, go through the entire five years. But in postgraduate uh, students, few departments have mentors as well, okay, which they allot mentors. Um, sometimes it has happened that way. So in terms of training programs, if you're talking about clinical mentorship, we have a, we have a program that we have designed. But it depends on for what purpose you want uh, the program design. It has to be fit the purpose, yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, then Dr. Joseph Philip Raj has a question. Is mentoring skill an inborn asset or can it be developed later? Uh, good question. I think uh, uh, Joseph is from St. John's, I think, yeah. Uh, uh, it is like, like, I think it's a skill that can be, that it, not, nobody is a born mentor. I agree with you, absolutely. And it's something, and it's very important. There are studies to show that if a mentorship program has, is uh, part of the program is training of the mentor and training of the mentees included in the program, there's a 90% success of mentor, uh, mentorship program, a successful in 90%. If only the mentors are trained, suppose be 50%. If there is no training of mentee and mentor, so the success rate is supposed to be 10%. There's one paper which actually discusses this issue, saying that training of mentors is, if you're going to start a program, is absolutely essential. Yes, sir. And uh, Dr. Ravindra Inamdar is asking yes. how to do this for UG 150 numbers. So I'll tell you, there are, I, I suppose it has to be something that you have to internally discuss and see that everybody agrees with it. But I'll tell you what we follow in St. John's. What we have done is that we had taken 50 faculty every year. For example, year one, 50 faculty, we have 150 students. Each faculty gets three students, right? So I, I'm from year one, I get five, three students. And then the next year, the next 50 faculty get in. They get three students from the next batch. And then following year, another one, uh, 50 faculty. Uh, so I get another set of three students on the fourth year. So at a point in time, I will have six students under me, three senior students and three junior students. That's how we go. And uh, I, I think this is, there's no hard and fast rule about this. It depends upon your logistic requirements and you, know, you have to design it. And uh, uh, initially we did have a program where people said, uh, the preclinical uh, departments are in constant contact with the students. So the mentor should be only from the preclinical departments. And we found and we did that and we had mentors from paraclinical in the second year, mentors from the clinical group in the final years, but didn't really work because for mentorship and relationship to work, it needs time. Relationship building doesn't occur with two meetings. When you have the same student with you for five years, there is a relationship that does, does build. But if you're going to meet for two times and expect a trust and relationship to occur, it doesn't occur. Definitely, definitely. Sir. Dr. Shamana Shirin is asking, how frequently should a mentor and mentee meet? And should it be individually or in a group? 
No, that is a good question. The recommended is at least once every two months they should meet, and it should be a program because you know we are not talking about a mentor mentorship program that occurs voluntarily. We are talking about an organized program. Mm -hmm. There, there should be a structure program. Only then can uh, things begin to happen. If you let it loose and you don't for, for put a structure in. very often there may be two or three success stories and that's all it just falls apart i think at least uh, there is one particular place where they actually mentioned there should be at least two once in two months they should meet so there's and there should not only meet it's also good to have some sort of structure to that you meet maybe you can plan on what you want to discuss then there could be some sort of a reflection that you say and say okay this is what we discussed and in the next meeting there should be an action plan if you don't have an activity tagged you know a planned activity that you're going to say okay by next meeting we will be shall do this we work towards this if you don't have that action point then it becomes just a social meeting social meetings can also help in the relationship building but it cannot be only that there should be something beyond that so i think maybe at least once in two months even if it's once in three months is fine but it should be a structured program that will help uh, especially because most of us are not really used to having this mentoring program in our institutions yes sir uh, then dr raj rajaj jay kumar you are asking role of ethics on mentor and menti program Uh, any particular specific uh, uh, ethics uh, any particular questions sir like seeing as um uh because i am not too sure see ethics is something that you can learn in that program in the mentorship program i don't know if it if you're talking about you know uh, ethics in terms of uh, uh, being the teacher and the mentor or uh, is it to do with gender related things I, I, any specific uh, uh, question that we have in the ethics i'd be happy to hear that yes sir then then there is one question uh, uh, from again dr joseph philip raj how do you yeah. evaluate mentorship program in your institution and how often it is done so we we at the moment we don't have anything for we have we uh, evaluate the process as of now in the sense we make sure we we want to know how many faculty have actually met you know how many you know times have they met at all is it being is it happening at all you know well, we have to start looking at uh, Cap capturing the outcome, and we haven't done that yet. In terms of maybe when the when the students leave to capture what happened, what worked well, what are the challenges, we haven't evaluated that. As of now, we are evaluating only the process to find out, and uh, we have a meeting, periodic meeting of the mentors, because there are challenges that the mentors come across, and it's good to share their experiences, our experiences, you know, share between mentors. So we have a sharing sort of a thing that occurs once in six months. and uh, we just monitor how often they've met and how many have met and how many have not met and that sort of stuff yes sir uh, dr vijisha falgunan is asking where do we fit mentoring in our curriculum mentoring will be uh, uh, not so much for teaching the curriculum it's for the it's for beyond that it's you know it's not really uh, tagged to the curriculum that way it's in addition to the curriculum of sorts it's outside that time it's not inside the curriculum time right 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 sir uh, dr nalini is asking who qualifies to be a mentor and in a medical college with so many ug pg students all junior staffs are mentors when they themselves probably need a mentor that's a comment absolutely you're absolutely right that's a good question in fact uh, in the discussion this is how we went about our thought process and we said if we don't start okay if we don't start now as of now associate profs and professors are included as mentors in our institution mm -hmm. right but i'm saying if we don't if the assistant professors and the junior faculty don't get involved with this after 5 years after 6 years after 10 years even if they didn't do mentoring properly in the initial years they will ha they have to build their own experience how do they build their experience they have to build the experience by being a mentor so only if mentorship is part of regular faculty culture can you know at some stage they will have that experience 
So if we begin to start only, so we are saying that we will in fact want to include assistant professors onwards so that after three, four years, maybe the first year is tough. We don't know. We also want to learn. But the, as you become senior, you actually done mentorship three, four years and you begin to learn and share that experience. So there is no other shortcut. You have to start somewhere. So we initially started with including only associate professors and professors. Now we are including assistant professors also into the pool. Yes, sir. Uh, so Dr. Kavita is asking, uh, can you, sir, can you suggest ways of becoming a role model? Oh, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I, I, role model, in, uh, I don't know. See, one, I'll tell you another way to example this. Uh, for postgraduate teaching, okay. Uh, I'm the wise dean for postgraduate teaching. So I could focus on logbook, okay? I could focus and design a beautiful logbook. I can focus and design a beautiful curriculum. But I'm thinking, and that's what we're going by here. We're saying if, if, for example, I'll give you, if we can build a department. If, imagine a department where they have three major grants, NIH studies going on. They're doing, you know, 100 surgeries going on, multiple busy, state-of-the-art work going on. And, you know, the number of patients I see is so many. In a situation like that, if you put a PGN, you, they will learn. You know, it's, there's role modeling there. You know, people are doing research. People are doing wonderful surgeries. You know, how all that is happening. But instead of that, imagine another situation where there's hardly any surgeries being done. No research happening. You have three faculty in the whole department. You put a PG there. So I think in terms of provide, especially for postgraduate training, you need to have a wonderful environment there. If you can build that environment, then I think that's what we have to focus on. You don't need a logbook and other things, you know. So in a role model, you have to be, if you want to teach them about research, you have to role model research. You teach them professionalism, you have to be a professional. If you're coming, if you're taking money on the slide, you're coming late, that is a different mentoring, yeah. Yes, yes. Then, uh, sir, there is one question. In him, uh, Dr. Vasavi is asking, uh, sir, in mentor and uh, mentor and mentee program, is the mentor same throughout the MBBS for a mentee? Yes, the thing is, that's a good question. I told you, uh, we have experimented with it. We had initially there was a thought, the faculty thought it's good to have because the anatomy, biochemistry teachers don't connect with the students after they go and become in the final year. There's a thought that they should be mentors only for that group. That didn't work. I told you because relationship building takes time. Now what we have is that the mentees are with me uh, as a faculty for the entire five years. And even beyond. Quite a few of them will keep in touch with you even after and some, you know, some come back and join PG course. Even some of them are gone abroad. They'll keep touching with you. It depends on the type of relationship that you have with them. So for the five years, the question is, is the same, is the mentee going to be the same faculty for the five years? Yes. yes. As of now, that's the structure we have. Yeah. Uh, uh, there is one question from uh, Sum, uh, Dr. Sumanar. Can yes. we undergo yes. uh, training in mentorship? Is yes, if yes, what, where, how? Okay, I don't know of any formal training programs uh, here, but... Uh, uh, we do have one program in St. George. I, know, I don't know if you people have JIPMA. I don't know if I have a particular program in that. And uh, I don't know of that. I don't know if there's any particular program already available like that. But uh, anyway, JIPMA is a center to start it off. Yeah. <laughs> no, we also it's don't strengths are there. Maybe we can start something. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah. So I reckon Dr. Joseph Philip Raj is asking, how do you envisage mentoring or guiding postgraduate students who are already grown up adults no particularly uh, because they are adults and uh, uh, like somebody earlier mentioned about the thin line between teaching and mentoring particularly because they are adults you can't teach the adults like we teach uh, school people right i mean it's all about providing the environment it's about more more in the uh, towards mentoring right so you have to provide the opportunity, provide the environment, give them the reason to learn and they will learn and, you know, provide that opportunity. I think for postgraduates particularly, in, in a way, we all do that in a way. 
we are already doing it. Maybe we're not calling it that. We actually do more mentoring than, you know, classroom-based teaching. We guide and support and, you know, that sort of a thing. I think it's more, that's how most of our teaching actually even now is occurring. Yes, sir. So, Dr. Swati is asking, many students come to us with their personal issues in a mentor-mentee yes. relationship. What are yes. the limitations in such situations? So that's a good point because uh, sometimes uh, uh, you cannot you cannot play the role of the parent or you cannot play the role of a psychiatrist. Sometimes even that happens. Okay, so those are those are the lines uh, that you have to understand. Okay, beyond a point, those are things that it is sort of uh, there's no hard and fast rule about it. But those are the lines that you have to understand. At a certain point, there's a things that ha you have to get, you know, there's a confidentiality area as well, because if you don't have confidentiality, the student will not trust you. And that sort of uh, environment will not, it won't work. They want that whole purpose is for the student having a problem to come to you. If the student feels that they're going to talk about it and be judgmental, they're not going to come to you. On the other hand, beyond a point, you do have to bring in the parents and behind, behind a point, you have to, perhaps bring in the dean or the psychiatrist. I don't know. It depends on the situation. Do, we do have to draw the lines, yes. yes sir. Then, sir, uh, should the mentor, uh, this question is from Anusia goes, should the mentor provide advice and suggestions only when the mentee is willing to get the feedback? No, that's, the thing is, it's it's not so much uh, uh, advice or suggestions, you know, it, it's, it's about, there is no suggestions and I think there should not be much advice that way. For example, if you're talking about what would be the best way, whether to go US or whether to go stay in, in India for for the studies, I mean, you're not going to tell them this is a better way to go about it. You're going to tell them what the situation is, allow them to think about it and make them make the decision. But you will provide them all the roadblocks. You will provide them the picture. You will provide them what are the paths available. You will tell them, you know, a helicopter view of what is available. Right. Okay, you provide that, but make the, the decision has to come from them, right? So if the person comes to you, yes, you have to provide because you have been there, you've done it. So you know what the roadblocks are, what are the things. So that's how it will be. Not so much as saying this is the best thing for you. Okay. Maybe there are situations where that also can occur. Maybe because you're a senior person, your wisdom tells you, I think you take this line. You are very good at this. Maybe this will work for you. It will happen. I'm not. I'm not putting a blanket on anything. Mm -hmm. But generally speaking, I think we are going to sort of provide them an overview, tell them all the paths available, talk to them about the roadblocks, and you know they will take call on what they think is right. But I agree. Sometimes we may also say, I think I've seen people in the past. You are wonderful. I think this is the line for you. I think you should go for it. And there are times when we may say that as well. I, I suppose it's it has to be individualized. Yes, sir. Uh, then uh, 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 Dr. Jarina is asking: Does mentor-mentee ratio in medical college affect the outcomes of mentorship programs? Oh, in some ways it will. I suppose that you can't have twenty mentees under you, right? I mean, it's a little too much to have yeah. because you can't give that much time and effort to that. Relationship building can be tough. So on the other hand, one or two or three mentees won't make a difference. I think that's okay. So I, I guess if the numbers are too much, it will be a problem. But uh, I think around uh, what, what used to happen, we St. John's, we used to have only 60 students at a time. There was a time where one person per year made it five uh, uh, students under you. That was comfortable. I think five to 10 will be comfortable. One more thing that happens actually when you have people of different uh, you know, which different years coming into the mentee group. When you meet as a group, there's pure mentoring as well. The final year student will provide support for a first year student, you know. There's some, that sort of a mix also sometimes works better, works well. It's not just only the mentor that has to provide the support, okay. It could be a senior person providing the support as well. Dr. Rajesh is asking, how can we assess mentoring will be effective? Okay. Uh, I, it depends on, see, for example, uh, if you're talking about uh, research mentoring, I tell you, I'm looking at the literature that I've read. When you talk about research mentoring, they're very clear. Uh, one of the factors I looked at is the amount of research done itself. 
with mentoring and without mentoring. So if your objective was to increase the number of research being done, then you can, you can check whether the objective was reached. In the same way, if you're talking about undergraduate mentoring, if your objective of that is in terms of uh, trying to see outcome, like you know, uh, uh, the success in exams, or the, uh, then you can look at that particular factor. We haven't really done that in, here in St. John's, I told you in the beginning, but uh, depending on what you, but some things it's very difficult to assess. It has to be some sort of a focal group discussion at the end of uh, the mentorship program to talk about, it must be a very, what do you say, um, uh, qualitative sort of a study rather than a quantitative study. Very true. Uh, Dr. Uh, yeah. Dr. Jayaprakash Rajan uh, from our medical issue here, he's asking one question, uh, are there any strategies for documenting mentor-mentee relationship and the outcomes of mentorship program? He also has added one more question, how to eliminate bias in selecting mentor-mentee? Uh, there is, a, I don't know how the bias will be there, sir, because um, we have just randomly allotting students to mentees. One of the constant uh, uh, questions that come to us is that uh, many faculty feel that with some students, they're not able to gel. They're, they're not of the same wavelength. It's not working out, okay? Now, that is where the mentorship training has to come in, okay? And uh, there's a feeling that uh, when you start mentor-mentee relationship, when you start the program, there's a feeling that you have to gel and sink in the first meeting. It, doesn't, it may not happen. That's where your intention of being a mentor comes in. Okay, in a program, in a medical college setup, when you're setting up a mentor mentorship program, it, you may land up with a student. And, you know, that's what I talked about. The first point I talked about is the unconscious bias. It's a lot of bias that we have, depending on, you know, from cultural backgrounds to, you know, so many things. Certain students we gel with, we are in sync with, certain students don't sync or gel with us. Now, but if the moment you start to practice it and you take the unconscious, you know, the, the bias out of it and you give time for a relationship to build and it does. So what we do here is we encourage them not to give up on anybody and to try it out further. But there will be a point at say, after a couple of years, it's not happening. Yes, I think you, it's, it's okay to change a mentor or mentee. That, that is also allowed. And I think it should be allowed because sometimes it may not work and it should be allowed. But on the other hand, you cannot give it up in the first shot. You have to, because it's not going to work like that for everybody. Mm -hmm. You know, if that was the case, then the only way it will work is voluntary choices. Right, sir. Uh, and the part of the question was any strategies for documenting mentor mentee relationship? And the, so when, the thing is, as of now, we do have a thing of documenting the process. And we have something about reflections on what happened during that meeting and the action points. That's what we're documenting. We haven't documented, only the process is being documented. Right. Outcomes we haven't designed, but I suppose outcomes are going to be more qualitative rather than quantitative. Unless we look at, you know, publications and past percentage attendance and things like that. Yes, sir. Uh... There is, uh, huh. there is one question from Dr. Manjunatha. Uh, yes. Rarely we get more enrichment in question and answer time than the presentation. Yes. This is one such session which he has a comment. This is one such session which demonstrated how a session can truly address the participants' need. Thank you, sir. Uh, they are appreciating yes. the discussion, but the good. Okay. okay. Thanks. Thank you. Yes, sir. sir there are a lot of positive comments. All, most of okay. the participants have liked the presentation. And for the participants, those who are interested, we skipped some questions due to the interest of time. Participants okay. who wish to connect with uh, Professor John Stephen, the email is given in the chat. Um, sure. They may send an email to you, so uh, you can. So, sir, uh, with this, uh, I will come towards the end. I'll uh, give a concluding remarks of your excellent presentation today. It was actually very illuminating. Uh, Professor John Stephen started with uh, the definition, the roles mentor play, and the difference between teachers and mentors. And one of the important thing was how the, in the steps of being a mentor, how we remove biases in accepting a mentee. The example of Death Valley that no glasses ever empty has to be kept in mind. This is something very crucial and very important. 
then uh, personal development in the face of challenges and adopting this principle in uh, mentee development this is one very good take home message from uh, professor john stephen's presentation and in addition trust building which is a slow and uh, steady process and which is important in the whole mentor mentee relationship uh, thank you again sir uh, professor stephen for your excellent uh, presentation and the excellent discussion which we had at the end with uh, active uh, participation from the audience thank you very much sir thank you thank you thank you for the opportunity thank you so much thank you we'll close